Now, before we get started, we couldn't possibly put on the show without our sponsors. So, if you haven't yet heard of or tried Heights, then what are you waiting for? You might already have a daily hair care and skincare routine, so it's about time that you made brain care just as important. It's what most of our secret leaders now add to their daily lives, trusting Heights to look after their most important organ for long-term health and nearer-term mental performance using a mix of plant-based omega-3s and key nutrients that science says our brains need to thrive, delivered through your letterbox every month. Listeners of this show can get £10 off a quarterly subscription with the code LEADERSHEIGHTS at yourheights.com. And I want to take a moment to let you know about the immense e-commerce marketing platform called Klaviyo. It's what I've been using at my own startup since we got going to get a full 360 degree view of my customer and I've not looked back since. Plus the fact that 50,000 other e-commerce businesses use it to find out what their customers are doing so they can analyze and act on it to convert means that they're the perfect solution. Whether your scale is from your first million to your first billion, Klaviyo will set you up for success on that journey so just visit klaviyo.com forward slash secret leaders. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O.com forward slash secret leaders today to find out more. And if you're fed up of scrolling through jobs on LinkedIn, I think you're going to love Otter. They've handpicked the most exciting jobs at tech companies in London. Now, many of these fantastic companies have been featured on secret leaders already, and they've got job openings on Otter too. For example, Slack, Bulb, Go Cardless, and Deliveroo. So, Otter is building a place for smart, ambitious people to find their new career challenge. Just find out more at otter.com, that's O T T A dot com, and find your new job there. Now to today's show. The reason we have a great relationship is because each of us are focusing on what we're giving to it, not what we're taking from it. In every conversation, in everything we do, even if it's just somebody asking for my time and we're going to say no, which we usually do, how do we do it in a way that's in a spirit of relationships? Because in the end, life is a pretty barren place unless it's relationships. If you'd like to hear more leadership stories, we now send a weekly email newsletter. It takes less than a minute to read and provides some enjoyable factoids about great leaders so you can impress people with your knowledge and maybe even become a better leader yourself. You can sign up at our website, secretleaders.com. Jim Collins is an entrepreneurial researcher, but best known as a best-selling author of multiple books that frankly, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't read, you've definitely got your priorities all wrong, which is why I'm personally so thrilled to have him on the show. Now, I've been an entrepreneur for almost 10 years now, and one of the first books I was ever given was Good to Great, his timeless classic, but since then I've also devoured his other classics like How the Mighty Fall, Built to Last, and Beyond Entrepreneurship, which Jim has just re revamped and updated with modern case studies fit for the new decade. Now, Jim is, as he calls it, not normal. But what exceptional leader of industry is. That's why they make it onto this show so listeners can learn all about them. His new book, BE or Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, is full of wisdom with a homage to his now deceased mentor and co-author Bill Lazier, and I found myself frantically taking notes, so get your pen ready because this is bound to fire up your neurons and get your thinking juice flowing. So, before we start, Jim, as I've just heard from our pre-chat, which I have to say is the longest pre-chat I've ever had, we've already been talking for a whole hour before we've started, you are also an avid listener of the show, which is awesome, which means you know exactly what's coming up next. Why don't you tell us what's coming? <laughs> the, the Rapid Fire Five or the Desert Island. Oh, you got, you, you got it. You got it. Okay, so we're going straight into it, and you'll really appreciate the first one we've had, uh, I've got for you on the basis of what we were just speaking about. Rock music or rock climbing? Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> I like to listen to rock music while rock climbing. Um, rock music, I can do that to the end of my life. Fair enough. And we were just talking about favorite bands. You know, I said mine was uh, Pink Floyd. And um, actually, didn't you mention your favorite band? You, we were picking between uh, Beatles and the Stones, and I threw in Pink Floyd. So who was your suggestion? I put Led Zeppelin in there. Excellent. Okay. Now, I know the answer, but others don't. Cats or dogs? Cat. Wise man. Sleep or exercise? 
Sleep. Deep work or deep play to unlock your happiness? Oh, work. Favorite book of yours by you? Oh, by me? Well, that's like asking for your favorite children. <laughs> you love them all, but different. Uh, I could ask that if you prefer. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I would, um, you know, this will surprise, uh, surprise people. Uh, I- I'm going to answer the, uh, the same way uh, that when I asked Peter Drucker when he was age 86, which of his 26 books he was most proud of, he said the next the one. The next one, yeah. And I'm going to say my favorite book is going to be the next one. It does sound good, to be fair. We were just talking about it. Um, okay, favorite book of yours by someone else? Winston Churchill's 4,996-page memoirs of the Second World War. Wowza. That's a sign of intelligence. That's putting something down right there. You sure it's not his next one? (laughs) If he's doing a next one, it's going to require a very special publisher. It really is. Some of that hologram technology that brought Tupac back as well. Um, Right. So favorite philosopher or source of wisdom that you wish more people knew about? Seneca. Hmm. Uh, quite a lot of people do know Seneca, in fairness. Yeah, okay. But, but, fa- uh, so, but favorite philosopher was was a question. Is, is Seneca your favorite philosopher? Well, be one. I, I, I kind of, they, we didn't have minors when I was an undergraduate. Uh, uh, Stanford just had majors. But I did a minor, if there was one, in, in philosophy. So, gosh, you know, I, I might then go with one. I might go with, in terms of having had an impact on how I think, I might go with Wittgenstein. Beautiful. Okay, finally, the question you know is coming, which is the desert island. So you can bring three things to sustain you. What are they going to be? Now, I always got to be clear on this. I have the internet or I don't? You don't, but you can bring the internet. and then. Oh, okay. So that can only be one of them. Okay, great. So especially if I don't have the internet, these are, these are the three. Um, laptop with a flash drive that has all my research files on it so I can finish my next book. And by the way, I love the idea of being on a desert island. I love monk mode. I'm genetically encoded for social distancing, so uh, that'd be a good place for me. Uh, number two is my home indoor rock climbing wall, uh, which I have, uh, along with lots of extra holds where I could set really hard problems that I would not finish before I was rescued. And then uh, number three, uh, music. Uh, I would bring a catalog of music from uh, I mean, I can't imagine a life without Beethoven, without classic rock, without the history of music. Uh, I think about the things that make life really, really le- worth living. It's really hard for me to envision it without what music does. Okay, we're going to go on to the show. Jim, I found it pretty hard to know exactly where to start. As you know, so many books, so much insight into leadership. But given that we do always discuss the personal life of our guests, I think it'd just be rude of me to jump in and start milking you for sound bites gleaned from your hard work over many years. So let's just start off with the life-changing moment that you met your co-author of the your latest book, Beyond Entrepreneurship, Bill Lazier. Yes. Um, who was he? Why did that relationship change your life? And was he like his namesake or was he a little bit more energetic than that? <laughs> yeah, so Bill, very brief. I, I grew up with... Uh, I had a father who was really not into being a father. And uh, it was pretty much MIA. Uh, He was an artist and very consumed being in in the artistic community and not a lot of energy for me. And I never learned from my father the things you like to learn from a father about values, about the difference between right and wrong, about how to come at life, about all the things you might like to get. And then he died when I was only 23, so we never got a chance to even have a chance at that. And so when I entered my early 20s, I had, I, I'd sort of describe it as that I was this really high energy creative propulsion machine, but it really lacked a sense of, of guiding purpose or, or direction uh, or, or guiding uh, principles and values behind it, but a lot of energy and a lot of drive. And in my uh, second year of, at the Stanford Business School, I'd studied mathematical sciences undergrad, and then I went off to Stanford Business School. I had this amazing moment. It was one of those luck events in life where the course lottery system, because I didn't get into a really popular section of a course, threw me into the first time offering from a totally unknown person named Bill Lazier. And Bill had had a successful business career and was coming back to kind of renew his life by building you know, young people. And so I went to the class thinking, I don't know anything about him, but I'll give it a a shot, take a day. So here you've got this 
random event. I, ju I just didn't, but the, law, the, the sort of course allocation system threw me into this section, and I have this person I meet, and my life completely changed because Bill, for whatever reason, took an interest in me. And he invested, uh, and he sensed he ne I needed this shaping. And he and Dorothy, his his wife, uh, always invited Joanne and me over to their house. And he just he really took on. He was the closest thing to a father I ever had. Everything I've done since, uh, nothing I've done, good to great, built to last, how the mighty fall, beyond entrepreneurship, whatever books come next, none of that would have happened had it not been for Bill. And when I was thirty, he then took this really gutsy move on my behalf when there was an unexpected opening for the entrepreneurship and small business class at the business school at Stanford that the star professor who was teaching that had a personal tragedy and they, they needed to fill the spot. And Bill went to the deans and said, why don't you give Jim a shot to do this? And he took the risk of putting me in that classroom. And then uh, that began everything for me and it's where I began my research on the question of what makes great companies tick. And from there, everything sort of followed for the following 32 years. And it was, it was this, this person who was mentorship in the, in the deepest sense of mentorship. He wasn't asking for anything. He just somehow had this very loving and demanding, really a parental role and he shaped me uh, and taught me these life lessons. And then we wrote our first book together, Beyond Entrepreneurship, uh, which was about how to turn a small business or entrepreneurial startup into an enduring great company. And that began my writing career and on from there through my research. Without Bill, none of it happens. We just wanted to give a big shout out to our long-term sponsorship partner, Clavio, who've just raised $200 million on a $4.15 billion valuation, so they can help more businesses like Heights do their marketing better. What a success story they're turning into. Well done, team, an inspiration for all of us, and we're looking forward to continuing working with you. And obviously recently he passed away, so you've got a lovely, lovely passage of um, like commemorating him, obviously. So... What, what would you say are the top lessons that, you know, in, in his memory and, um, and how, how would you want other people to think of him as your teacher, so to speak? Yeah. So in, in the upgrade of the book, and actually, let me just you know, briefly share why are we bringing out Beyond Entrepreneurship now as Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. And there's a couple of, of really critical reasons. You know, one is that to the surprise of many of our of people that have read the later books like Built to Last and Good to Great, they tend to think of him as about big companies. And actually, they were all once small companies. And uh, my original passion was for the entrepreneur and for the small business leader who Bill and I then wanted to challenge to build an enduring great company from that. That's what we wanted the class to be about was if you're going to build a company, don't just do a startup. Don't just do something to be successful. If you can, why don't you try to build a great and lasting company that can change the world? And that's the, that's the standard that Bill and I wanted to set for our students. And I wanted to come back to the entrepreneurial roots that that book was about. But the other reason is, when Bill died in 2004, uh, I was sitting there in Stanford Chapel, and I was thinking, I've got to write something about Bill. And I was looking at all these other people in the Stanford Chapel. And I, I thought of them as like vectors going out into time and space. And if you think about what a mentor does is affects the trajectory of a vector maybe early. And even if that shaping effect of the mentor turns the vector even five degrees early, over the sweep of a life, it's huge. And imagine if you did that then for not just one person, but 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people kind of like what your podcast is doing, right? You're, you're, you're changing vectors, right? That's the idea, you're changing vectors. And then they go out and change vectors. And I realized that all those people in, in that had, Bill had done that for these people. It was this massive effect on, on the world by changing people. And I said, I have, I have got to write something about Bill. And it was my wife, Joanne, who said, well, you know, Beyond Entrepreneurship had a very loyal following, but a small following maybe the best thing you could do is to write a chapter all about what you learned from Bill and honor Bill and extend his legacy and re-bring out the book you guys did together as this durable, permanent way to honor Bill. 
And that's, that's why we ended up doing it and that why the, the chapter starts there. In terms of the, the lessons, I, I put a number of them in the chapter, but I'll, I'll pick a couple that, well, they all had a real shaping impact on my, on my life. Uh, one of them is the idea that Bill always emphasized to me, which is if you wanna have a great life, I don't know if it's a happy life always, but a great life, the only, you can come at life as a series of transactions, or you can come at life as about building relationships. And that this is one of the great choices you have to make. Are you gonna be about transactions or are you gonna be about relationships? And Bill taught me about relationships, relationships. It's the only way to have a truly great life. And everything is relationships. You never do anything without thinking about it as a relationship. Even if you're at a restaurant and somebody is, is doing a great job bringing stuff to your table, there's still a potential for a relationship. Uh, and then in that, uh, I asked Bill at one point, and I'm, and I'm really struck by something that came up in one of your earlier podcasts, uh, one that I really enjoyed very much, uh, from uh, Arlen Hamilton. I, I believe, I hope I have her name right, right? Where she was really uh, marvelous and impressive, really love what she's doing. And she talked about this idea that, well, sometimes what people really mean by mentorship is they're really just looking for like networking and funding, you know, and, and, and I, that's not what mentorship is. That's not the relationship, that's transaction, right? And she, what she believes is mentoring should be a relationship. Well, I, I asked Bill one day, I said, uh, so what makes a great relationship? And he says, oh, if you ask each person in the relationship, who benefits more from the relationship? They each independently would say, I do. And I said, well, isn't that a little bit selfish? And he said, no, no, think about this for a minute, Jim. Let me ask you, who benefits more from our relationship? And I said, well, I do. I mean, I, my whole life's been changed by how you've shaped me. And he said, well, isn't, isn't that wonderful? Because I actually feel that I benefit more from our relationship and the creative things that we do together. And he went on through a number of things. And he said, see, that's the beauty. Each of us, the reason we have a great relationship is because each of us are focusing on what we're giving to it, not what we're taking from it. And I come at that, if you were around our little outpost here called the Good to Great Project, you would find in every conversation, in everything we do, we go back to, even if it's just somebody asking for my time and we're going to say no, which we usually do, how do we do it in a way that's in a spirit of relationships? Because in the end, life is a pretty barren place unless it's relationships. That's right. And, you know, you've got this really brilliant um, quote as well, which is, uh, well, again, to paraphrase, but, you know, relationships only work when you both think about what you can give to it, not what you can take. Transactions can make you, uh, can help you find success, but only relationships can make you have a great life. I hope I roughly paraphrase that right. Yes, that's absolutely exactly right. Probably said better than I wrote it. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I carry that out for the entrepreneur. It's something that, that Bill would have emphasized to anybody in, the, in our entrepreneurship classes where people are like, well, I want to make my company successful or whatever. And Bill would always remind uh, our students, the most important thing is to do work you love with people you love. And if you do work you love with people you love, you win. Mm, interesting. I, yeah, I've got a question actually because you know, you, like again, you've talked about level five leaders, and um, potentially we can talk about it. You know, it seems to me a lot of the level five conversation is is generally focused around um, uh, basically public company CEOs often, right? Um, you know, you see they're incredibly ambitious, but their ambition is first and foremost for the cause, for the organization, and its purpose, not themselves. But all that being said, I'm yet to actually meet a founder of a startup really whose ambition is for themselves rather than the cause, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, starting a startup is a terrible idea and an awful way to make money. Um, so I guess I'm wondering how you would attribute the definition of a level five leader to your typical startup leader rather than your typical sort of public company CEO. So I, I really appreciate the question for, for two reasons. The first is uh, just to very quickly deal with why did we study in our research, publicly traded companies. Very simple, that's where the data was. You know, I was very lucky early in my career to stumble on to studying you know, what makes great companies tick, looking at the, the success cases over history in contrast to their comparison control sets, 
And the beauty is publicly traded companies, there's a ton of information that you can rigorously do analyses on, but it's only because that's where the data is. My passion and main interest has always been in those that are not yet public or may never be public. Also, in all of our research, this is the second thing, you go back, a lot of what we studied was these companies, when they were small, when they were startups, before they became large publicly traded companies. And I, when you go into them, you find that, sure, there's a certain intensity of ambition that you need to launch and build a company, right? You're just exhausting. You're not just exhausted, you're also exhausting, and you're driven, and uh, and everybody around you is just like, hey, Gus, do you ever stop? No, we can't afford to stop, right? We just, all that's there. But if you go and you take like, say, Herb Kelleher, who was one of the, the founding entrepreneurs of Southwest Airlines, one of the great startups in all of history in the United States, later, of course, went public. But you go back to the early days, and the same things that you see in Herb Kelleher as being, I love my people, and I love what our company can do for our customers, and I am really driven to create something that is going to stand in contrast to what I see as the brutalities of the way others might operate. That you see when they had three aircraft. When you look at George Rathman in the early days of Amgen, starting out in the biotechnology company, of course, the intensity and the guts to start a biotech company in the 1970s when the technology was early, that's all there. But what is driving? Do you have any idea what recombinant DNA could do to fundamentally change and impact health? And then eventually, and then there's this beautiful circle. Think about this. Think about this, George Rathman starts Amgen. They, they, they eventually stumble upon doing EPO around, uh, around blood needs. Later in his life, because of his own condition, he's a patient of his own products. And this circle of the what they were creating comes back around and I had a little something to do with this, right? But that sense, and, and, and George Rathman, utter relentless will, but the personal humility, every, Herb Kelleher, strange, colorful character, but a personal humility. And I go into the private companies. I look at Ann Baker, who we write about in Beyond Entrepreneurship, mm. taking over her father's company at the age of 29. It's a small business. She turns it into a great mental health services business, but here's the key. She's 29 years old. She calls us up. We're up teaching at Stanford and we're working on beyond entrepreneurship. And she says, I took over my father's company. He died of an unexpected adverse medical treatment. Basically what happens, adverse uh, consequence of a medical treatment. I have my father's company. I want to honor the spirit of what my father led this company as being about. That's what I want. And we got together with her team. And what was it all about? It wasn't about delivering services, growing a business. She said, I said, well, what's it about? She said, for my father, it was about helping people with mental impairments realize their full potential. And I want this company, of course, to be successful, but the reason it needs to be successful is so that we can do that for more people. This is a small business at the time. So I actually think that this level five drive is as maybe even more prominent in the great entrepreneurs who build great companies than in your garden variety, corporate, publicly traded CEO. So delighted to say a different kind of heights ad this week because we just raised over one million pounds on crowdfunding on Cedars in a record breaking 20 minutes, the fastest ever for a health and wellness company. Um, it's been a very exciting seed round. We've had some of the top founders in Europe basically investing in the round, a um, couple of surprise celebrity investors as well, which has been quite enjoyable to see more people taking care of their brain. I would encourage you to go check out the campaign at cedars.com forward slash heights. But to be honest, you know, by the time you were even listening to this, it might be over. So instead, uh, why not just go to yourheights.com and use your code leaders for £10 off a three month subscription to start taking care of your brain, just like the fantastic Jim Collins is currently doing right now. So back to a well fed brain and a sharp mind with Jim Collins. There is a beautiful line I really liked in your new book uh, that says, 
Leadership is a responsibility, not an entitlement. A decision, not an accident. A matter of willful action, not genetics. Whether you learn to lead greatly, in the end, is a choice. So can you tell us what kinds of choices you're referring to from your research and the crossroads that you've actually observed and the responsibility taken by the leaders you've followed? And I think one of the really interesting themes as well, just to tap it up there as well, that you'll, you'll notice as a listener of the show anyway, is, you know, a lot of this stuff is actually about sacrifice, right? So great leadership also usually includes great sacrifice. So it'd be interesting to hear your take on that, please. So um, let me actually start with, I want to dispel a myth and I want to tell a little story. The myth. Uh, and, we, and we hit it head on in, uh, I think, the essay you're referring to. But anyways, we hit it head on. There's this myth that there's this thing called the, the entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneurial personality, uh, the entrepreneurial sort of startup creative person. And uh, they're strange and unusual. They're like these weird, bizarre colored bugs or something. And anyways, but there's this thing called the entrepreneurial temperament. And, but it sort of runs out of steam that the company reaches a certain point then we're, okay, you've now done the entrepreneurial thing, and now it's time for the people who have a different temperament, right? We need the professional managers. We need the, uh, the people who are gonna come in, and we, you need to go back on now and do the entrepreneurial thing, because that's kind of the animal that you are. Uh, and, and there are other people who are the builders. Wrong, 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 wrong. Not as a blanket idea anyways. If you look at a lot of the greatest companies, the people who built them into the greatest companies were the founding entrepreneurs. Yeah, I would say especially the greatest companies, right? I'm actually struggling to think of many of the greatest companies where the founder wasn't the CEO. Exactly right. So you can go and you can take and begin to look at people. You know, Just think about, for example, uh, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore of Intel. Bill Gates, right? Jeff Bezos. We'll come back to Steve Jobs in a minute. Walt Disney, J. Willard Marriott, Sam Walton, Ed Catmull, Phil Knight of Nike, Herb Kelher of Southwest Airlines, right? All of those. Wendy Kopp would teach for America. We could go through Ann Baker. So she took over her father's company, but it was small, small enough that it was still very entrepreneurial. Every one of these folks that were there early, they were the early shaping architects of the company. What you find is their tenure in the role is more like, I think in, in Bill to last we calculated it is 36 years in harness, not three. And when somebody says, comes to you as an entrepreneur, and I want every entrepreneur out there to think about this. When somebody comes to you as an entrepreneur and they say, maybe it's a board member, maybe it's a venture capitalist, maybe it's somebody who says, you know, it's kind of time for you now to step away and let these other people build it because you're the entrepreneur. Well, you may choose that you don't want to build it. That's a choice. That's a legitimate choice. You may say, it's not my creative impulse in life to build this into a great company. I just want to start it. Okay, if that's who you are, then that's who you are. But never let anybody tell you that it is a foregone conclusion for you to be able to go to scale your own leadership right along as the company scales. That's what every one of these people do. Yeah, I completely hear that. You know, I just, there's a couple of things. I know you want to talk about um, Steve Jobs and I'll give you the opportunity to, because obviously he's the, uh, you know, the complete outlier there with his scenario. You've got a part um, when you talk about, you know, the, the minibus, essentially, when you're talking about you know, you've got so many seats on the minibus and really as a leader, you've got a choice. Are you a hire and fire or are you a, a, a person that's going to let someone develop and flourish and you're going to take the time because there's only so many seats on that bus. Your company's success is basically defined by the people you've got on the bus. So you've got to pick right, but very, very rare does someone pick, you know, say there's 12 seats. It's very rare for someone to pick all 12 perfectly, but sometimes you do have the perfect 12. It's just some will take some some nurturing and some time. And I feel like there's, I mean, I'm paraphrasing probably rather badly, um, but I'm sure you know what I'm referring to from uh, from the book at the start. I guess I'm wondering, is there sort of an analogy here, though, where, you know, your shareholders and your VCs are put into the same position as you're talking about there? And it's really up to them to decide whether they want to give you the space and time as the leader to nurture, whether you're the right person for that minibus. 
Well, I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting uh, connection that you made between uh, those, those two essays in there because, you know, one is about, you know, you're thinking about the people on your own bus and do you tilt really towards developing them or replacing them if they're struggling in a key seat. We have a whole section in there on that. But I think this is really interesting then to carry it over to the, to, to the question of the, uh, of the entrepreneur. And uh, it's absolutely clear when we look in the history of our, of our companies is that the great entrepreneurs who became great company builders, uh, they did uh, grow into it and either by, because they had control of the company, right, or it remained private, uh, or because of fortuitous circumstance or whatever, uh, they were able to stay with it long enough and keep the company growing long enough that they themselves, so as the company went from 1x to 2x, they were able to grow themselves from 1x to 2x. And as the company went to 10x, they were able to grow themselves to 10x. And I actually think that you know something that Peter Drucker always used to emphasize is this idea that the best way to be a really good manager is to make your, is to improve your own personal performance. Because if you do that, you improve the performance of those around you. Well, the same same is true here is if you want to grow your people, your first task is to grow yourself. And that is what these people do. They, they grow themselves and therefore they grow their people. But let me just very briefly here, because I think this is a, there's a great story to illustrate how much people can grow. And that is the story of Steve Jobs. And it sort of weaves in with all of these different sort of themes that we're talking about. So in 1988, when I was first starting to teach the the entrepreneurship and small business course that became the, the, the basis for uh, this re-release book. Bill got me into the class. He took that big bet on me and, and the deans gave me this chance to teach and I'm thrown into this class and, and I, I had this syllabus that I, I kind of rewrote the opening line to basically be around, this is gonna be not about the mechanics of the small business, it's gonna be about how to turn an entrepreneurial venture or new business into an enduring great company. And I wrote that and I said, wow, I don't know anything about that, but I'm gonna figure it out and it's still what the course is gonna be about. But I thought I needed some gravitas for the course. So uh, to help me sort of really set that standard for my students. So I picked up the phone out of the blue and I called Steve Jobs. And I said, hi, I'm, you know, I'm down here at the business school. As you do, of course. <laughs> and, and he says, uh, and Steve in my experience was always very gracious. Uh, he said, I'd be happy to. And he comes down and and uh, I'll still remember, I'll, I still remember the day so vividly, including the, which was our first time that we, we met. And I remember the, uh, uh, you know, sitting there, I was 30 and he was 36 at the time. And I remember thinking, feeling so intimidated because I realized what he'd already done by the age of 36. <laughs> it made me feel very small. But anyways, he, he says, uh, so what do you want to talk about? And we had this marvelous like two hour session on creativity and building companies and high standards. But partway through that session, he says, well, I got booted out of my last company. Okay, now this is 1988. What's 1988? Three years before, a bunch of people had kind of come to the conclusion that he needed to be replaced with the sort of standard, now we need the professional managers to build the company. And so he loses control of his own company in this bitter boardroom battle. And he goes off into the wilderness. And in this time that he's in the wilderness, and, and this was a wonderful, another luck event in my life, who luck event. I got to meet uh, him when he was in the wilderness. 1988 was so much the wilderness. You know, there was this gathering around the time that he was in the wilderness of these top executives in Silicon Valley for a meeting with the president. And as I understand it, 500 were invited and he didn't get an invitation. I mean, this is the wilderness. And it's years before I mean, it's 1988. He doesn't come back into Apple till 1997. And yet, if you watched him, two things were happening. One, his incredible drive and passion and energy and that is kind of coming through the eyes of bicycles for the mind and the power of the idea that you can make one computer a thousand times more powerful but put it in one hand or make a, th a computer one one thousandth as powerful and put it in a thousand creative hands and let them bloom, right? And his incredible passion for that was never going to stop. And he just kept working at the computer company next. And eventually gets to come back into, into Apple. He never was bitter about it, but here's the second thing that was happening. He was growing from Steve Jobs 1.0 into Steve Jobs 2.0. And when he came back into Apple in 1997, 
we share a little story in the book about, I had a conversation with him a few years after that about what did he first focus on. And of course there was discipline and costs and all that, but people and finding the right people to build a company that could really endure and be great beyond him. And he went from that young, immature entrepreneur through this humbling experience of the wilderness to then come back. Steve Jobs 2.0 was different than Steve Jobs 1.0, measured, seasoned. He grew into the CEO that could then take Apple from its near death time of 97 into a company that could thrive well beyond his own life. And when I look at that, people make the mistake. I, this is, I feel very strongly about this. They'll read about Steve Jobs' emotional or entrepreneurial immaturity when he's 20 years old and think, well, that's what you need to be. And I look at that and I say, well, look, all of us, if, if somebody wrote, a, wrote, a, wrote stories of me when I was 20 years old, I'd be terribly embarrassed because when you're 20 years old, you're 20 years old. But he grew and he matured and he got better and he, and he was humbled by the experience and he learned from Ed Catmull about how to create a culture of genius. And then it's really the real story is the story of him going then to that level five for Apple, that it wasn't about him and it was going to be about a great company beyond him and the seasoned executive who could do that. Now I look at that and I say, you know, we can look at it and say, uh, entrepreneur just remains entrepreneur, or no. The growth is a choice. It's a great, it's a great story, and I completely agree um, with the concept that growth is a choice. You know, it's funny now. Now we're into the community questions, and I'm looking at them. I'm like, I'm going to throw my questions out out the window for the. Well, moment. that's okay, and you can you, you, know, you can come back to yours as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm going to do the good leadership thing, and uh, you know, let other people have a voice as well. So. We've got a great question here from Ollie Barrett, and he's asked that you uh, talk to us about the Stockdale paradox, which obviously is from good to great, and why you think it might actually be important in the year of a global pandemic. So context for 2020. Wow. Um, Stockdale paradox has been profoundly impactful on my own life and on uh, companies. Let me just share the story of what it is. And everybody who's listening to this, by the time you hear this, Anybody out there, it's very unlikely that this time of uncertainty, uh, this time of the pandemic is going to be past us. Uh, we are going to be going through uh, maybe a very dark winter. Okay, so that's, oh, maybe not, maybe something will happen, but the odds are different. So the Stockdale paradox, and I immediately thought of Stockdale when the, when the pandemic hit. Admiral Jim Stockdale was the highest ranking military officer in the Hanoi Hilton prisoner of war camp. He was shot down uh, in the late 1960s, and he spent seven years in the camp. Uh, he had a burden of command and leadership while also being a prisoner. They could pull him out and torture him at any time, and they did. They could put him in leg irons for long periods of time, and they did. And I had the privilege to get to know Admiral Stockdale a bit when I was teaching my course on small business at the business school and across the street at the Stanford Hoover Institute. Jim Stockdale, Admiral Stockdale, was studying Stoic philosophy. And uh, in preparation for my first chance to spend time with Admiral Stockdale, uh, to, to talk with him, uh, we we're going to have lunch and walk on the campus, I read his book, In Love and War, uh, which is alternating chapters uh, by himself and his wife about his years in the camp. And he got a picture. I'm sitting there in my nice, kind of beautiful, paneled, warm Stanford office reading this book. And I started to get depressed. Because what struck me is, you know, obviously you have the torture and, and the leg irons and all that, but what struck me is so hard was this idea that he had no idea if he would ever get out. He had no idea how long he would be there. He had no idea when the end might come. It's not like you enter the Hanoi Hilton and they hand you a slip that says your release date is December 31, 1972. You have no idea. It could be 82, 92, it could be the rest of your life. And it was that never ending, bleak, that's what struck me so bleak and oppressive. And it's like if you've ever been in a dark place in your own life and you just have no idea when it's gonna end, it just feels like, it, how long is this gonna go? And you don't know. And then it dawned on me, oh my goodness, I'm feeling this and I'm reading it. 
I'm sitting in this nice office and I'm reading it. I'm not living it. Oh, and I know the end of the story. I know that he gets out. I know he reunites with his family. I know we're going to have lunch together and a walk on the Stanford campus here in a few days. How on earth did he deal with it, living it, and not knowing the end of the story? So I asked him, and I remember to this day where we were standing, we're standing right on a corner of the quad, and he stopped and he said, oh, I, I, never, I never capitulated to despair because I never ever wavered in my faith, not only that I would get out, but I would turn this into the defining event of my life that in retrospect I would not trade. And there was a long, quiet time. We walked. And then I said, Admiral Stockdale, who didn't make it out as strong as you? And he said, uh, oh, that's easy. It was the optimist. <laughs> I'm confused. He says, oh, what I mean by the optimist. So those who always say, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and it would go. And we're going to be out uh, by Easter and it would come and it would go. Oh, and then we're going to be out by Christmas again. And they suffered from a broken heart. And this is when I learned the lesson from Admiral Stockdale that you must never ever confuse the need on the one hand for unwavering faith that you can and you will prevail in the end with the need on the other hand for the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality right now as they actually are. We're not out of here by Christmas. It's the, old, it's the ultimate entrepreneur's frame too, right? Faith and facts. And years later, when we were doing the research for Good to Great, I kept thinking about the Good to Great leaders and how they led their companies through often years of desperate times before they made that inflection. And I realized they, they really felt like Stocktail to me. And so I just shared the Stocktail story very much the way I just shared it with you with the research team. And we all sort of jumped in and realized that was how our leaders came at things. They had both sides of that duality. And so I, we called it the Stockdale Paradox. It, it's, it's part of the kind of a particular genius of the end. We are in a Stockdale time. We are in a Stockdale time. Our countries are in Stockdale time. We as individuals are in Stockdale. I mean, Joanna and I were just sitting around this morning as we're going to getting closer to another full lockdown here in Boulder. And it's kind of like, well, gosh, it's only early November. I'm already tired, but... You have to have the, and when you're leading a business or a company, the unwavering faith that you will prevail in the end. And at the same time, this incredible discipline to confront the brutal facts. I would want everybody to always have the Stockdale paradox, but this time it's particularly important. I want to tell you guys about the immense e-commerce marketing platform called Klaviyo. It's what I've been using at my own startup since we got going to get a full 360 degree view of my customer and I've not looked back since. Plus the fact that 50,000 other growing e-commerce businesses use it to find out what their customers are doing so they can analyze and act on it to convert means they're the perfect solution. Whatever scale you're at, from your first million to your first billion, Klaviyo sets you up for success on that journey. Visit K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com today to find out more. I think it's interesting I don't, that you don't, you know, engage in politics and stuff. Are you familiar with the the Coinbase um, positioning around um, a blog that he put out, the founder put out, Brian Armstrong, around not getting involved in politics? And if you want to be uh, working at this company, then you need to leave your politics at the door and the kind of reception that that got, obviously splitting people um, down the middle. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. No, obviously, and how did it split people? Better. I mean, very divisively, like everything in 2020. Because this was off the back of the Black Lives Matter stuff and was very much like, you know, this is, you know, these are political issues, Trump's political issues. Um, I'm not saying that we're not in support of these things. However, we're a mission led company. We're on a mission and people are here to do the job and that will gravitate people to our business that want to focus on doing meaningful work and not getting embroiled in opinions and politics, etc. 
And it's just so interesting, right? Because that's so completely different to how someone like a Peter Thiel or a Reid Hoffman would run a business, right? Who are very hard on their sleeve about their beliefs, but completely welcome opposing views and think that that's what builds great culture. Whereas obviously what he's saying is that is all one big distraction. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's it's interesting. I guess I would uh, uh, one. It's just you know, it's a as a as a studier of of companies and their values over the long course of time. Uh, one of the things that we found all the way back in Built to Last is that there's no one set of values that's the right values for building a great company. Uh, we found that what really matters is the authenticity of your values and that uh, you can have two companies that have somewhat different value systems uh, and both be incredibly successful because what they share in common is the, the, the genuine, deep, passionate belief in those values and in making decisions consistent with them. Now, if for a company, one of those values is something that carries out into a world that is um, very cause-driven, then you would need to be very congruent with those values and very out with those. So for example, one of the people that I've always admired for the authenticity of values, uh, regardless of where I sit politically, is Yvonne Chouinard, uh, and then his the, the the person who built the company with him, Christine McDivitt at Patagonia. Uh, I was going to ask you about him. Funnily enough, you say that. I think it's because you're wearing a Patagonia top. I am wearing a Patagonia top. I'm wearing a Patagonia yeah, I was immediately R1. I gravitated towards asking if you'd if you'd met him before and what you thought about his leadership style and. I'm just a huge fan. And I actually, over the summer, read Let My People Go Surfing, finally, uh, which is obviously hugely inspiring. And anyway, yeah, so it's funny that you bring him up because I was going to ask you about him. Okay, so well, let's let's talk about, about Patagonia, uh, Von Schnard. And also, you have to really, Christine McDivitt, uh, who was uh, what he described as his bomb-proof belay, uh, was, they, they were a great team because he was like the great visionary and she was the one who really, built the culture and the company, and you really have to understand through both of them. And I used to have Christine, Chris, uh, come to my class at Stanford because we wrote a case on Patagonia uh, that's a number of the elements of that case are actually in Beyond Entrepreneurship, where uh, we would update the case every year. And it was in in the late 80s to early 90s as the company was really starting to uh, emerge. It remained private, of course, over all that time. And Chris uh, would come to the class, and I would teach the case, and then she would uh, share the views of what Patagonia is really all about. And and what's really powerful about Patagonia is that they've always had this, going back to Yvonne, this fundamental belief around uh, their role as environmental stewards and a a catalyst, really, for changing uh, towards a more sustainable way of doing business. Now, today, a lot of people will We'll talk about that, right? Or it'll be put on their posters or whatever. But what's powerful and the reason why you stand back, and this is the way any company should be, whatever the values are, you go back to the very early roots of the company. When it's a tiny company, that ethos is there from the beginning, right? And even if it hurt their business. So I was a rock climber. I grew up in Boulder uh, and some in San Francisco. But by the time I was in my early teens, I was rock climbing here in Boulder, Colorado. Now, back in the late early 1970s, the way that we rock climbed, uh, the way we protected ourselves on climbs, is we would use pitons, which you have these metal spikes, right? And you ping, 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 you pound them into the into the rock, and you hear it go in, and if it makes the right sound, then that's not going anywhere. And you clip in, and you feel totally safe. And uh, But you know, as climbing became more popular, we began to realize that we were damaging the cliffs. And yeah, that- facing the environment you look to protect. Exactly, the very environment that, that we're climbing on, we're destroying. And there's like a famous climb in Yosemite called Serenity Crack that I still remember the picture of it. it was basically a beautiful thin crack, but then scarred with these pockets that had been from the pitons. And, uh, and so Yvonne uh, got swept up in this thing called clean climbing. And the idea behind clean climbing was instead of pounding pitons into the rock, which then the second person would pull them out, which would you know be over time scar the rock, that we would use nuts, which is picture like a you know, literally a like a washing nut or a you know a, a bolt or something that you could put a, a, a thread through and then drop it in a crack and have it where the crack tapers, it wedges right, and so it's clean. And when you pull it out, it leaves no scar. But for climbers who are used to pitons to trust your life to just this piece of metal you slotted into the crack, we had to make, I mean, it was, yeah, remember the the dryness in in your tongue is you're like, boy, I hope that holds because otherwise I'm hitting the ledge if I fall off. 
So what he did was he put out this catalog. I still have the catalog. I still have the catalog. They're a tiny company. And it was a manifesto for clean climbing. And essentially was saying, we want you to stop buying our products. You all want pitons. We don't really want you to buy pitons anymore. We want, but then he provided the solution, which was these things called eccentrics and stoppers and so forth. But he was using his company to change the behavior of the climbing community. Now, I look at that, and that was in the very early days of the shift to clean climbing. He used his company as a catalytic force. I grew up in it. My behavior was changed by the leadership that that company exhibited and the challenge that Yvonne gave us in that manifesto, which was nominally a catalog, but was really a manifesto, and changed the entire climbing community. Later, as they went on and made all their great soft goods and so forth, every product, you know, they don't necessarily make a, if you don't get the color R1 that you want, they may not make more, right? They'd rather have people buy less and keep it longer. That's deep in the roots of the company. My point on this overall is that it's not those values per se that make Patagonia great, although I was very affected by those values of we shouldn't scar the rock. But what it was is the incredible authenticity behind those values that go all the way back long before it was fashionable. It was deep. It was like you, you don't sit around and say, what value should we have? What values will other people applaud us for? It's what values do we hold inside our personal guts right down to our tippy, tippy toes? What do we as individuals hold dear? And we will build upon those. Authenticity of it. That's the message of the Patagonia story. It's not don't copy their values if they're not your values. Yeah, and like you say, you know, people think the... Um you know, having values and living by your values is the soft stuff, but actually doing it right is the hardest thing you'll ever do. That was one of the lessons that Bill taught me. In the chapter we write about the lessons I got from Bill, Bill taught me it's always, you know, values first. And I'm like, boy, I better get, you know, better really figure out my values. And he helped me do that. He really shaped my values for the rest of my life. But what Bill always emphasized is that people think values is the soft stuff. You know, the hard stuff is strategy and finance and accounting. That stuff's easy. It's like math and capital is capital. That stuff's easy. What's hard is, are we going to ask our customers not to buy our primary product line? What's hard is when you're in a time like COVID as an airline that loves your people, what hard values decisions are you going to make? The hardest discipline is living to your values. It's not strategy and finance. That's just simple intellectual stuff. Hey guys, I want to tell you about our awesome long-standing recruitment partner and where I go to hire top talent every time, LaFosse Associates. They're not only the recruitment partner of choice for your host, but many of our guests too. So check out www.lafosse.com the next time you're looking for a brilliant hire. Jim, who would you say is the happiest leader you've ever met and why? The happiest leader? Oh, my. <laughs> now, that, <laughs> that's a great question because you know, I, I, uh, I don't know how to think about um, – people often ask me if I'm happy and, and I just have no idea how to answer the question. Well, and we've, I, we've talked about it separately as well, obviously, so I thought I'd throw that one right back at you and uh, see how you handle it. Well, you know, actually, uh, and, and this isn't just a, um, you know, because it's uh, where I started the book. It's actually really true. Uh, it really is true. Um, when you ask us, like, who's the happiest business leader I've ever known? I've, I've known lots of people, and they're, they're, they're really into what they're doing and so forth. Some of them are not happy. Some of them are happy. A lot of them, I don't think it's their goal either way. But Bill, Bill Lazier and I would say that one of the ways in which I wish I could still be more like Bill is to have embraced the sheer joy like him. And there's, there's a little story I want to share uh, with everyone because it just captures Bill's sense of... In fact, when I was talking with Dorothy last night when she got her first copy, we started writing Beyond Entrepreneurship. And uh, 
And again, I'm young at the time. I'm, I'm 30, 31, 32, something like that. And I'm trying to learn how to write. And, and I struggle as a writer. Uh, the reason that there's people say, oh, writing must be easy for you because a lot of your writing is easy to read. And it's like, no, it's easy to read because writing for me is hard. And I've always viewed writing as, as like running. It's always going to hurt and uh, you may run faster. So just because you just took your PR in the mile from you know, six minutes to five minutes doesn't mean it hurts any less. You're just faster, that's all. Just, but if your best time is always gonna hurt. And so writing always struck me as like that. And I, I'm struggling at the words and I'm throwing pages in the wastebasket and I'm feeling completely inadequate. And I go to Bill and I, and I, and I kind of whined and, uh, and Bill, we were co-authoring it together, but I was doing a lot of the drafting, and uh, and, and uh, I expected Bill to give me a lecture on like you know this is like the you know a marathon you know you hit 20 miles and you're only really halfway and the last six are where the the real grit happens and, and instead Bill just gave me this lecture on fun, and he says uh, you know if we're not having fun we should just stop, and he really lived like he just like if it's, if you can't find a way to make it fun you should just stop. And so the day after we turned in the manuscript, Bill had a quintuple bypass surgery, went into the hospital. And I, uh, this was 91 or 92, I guess. And uh, a few months later, we were having one of our morning uh, breakfasts. We would meet at the Peninsula Cre Creamery in Palo Alto, and we would have a Saturday morning waffle fest. And him always still continuing to try to shape me and develop me and push me and challenge me. And, uh, and he, he orders his waffle and he puts this big slab of butter on it and then pours this, you know, syrup all over it. And I'm like, Bill, Bill, you just had a quintuple bypass surgery. What are you doing? And he just kept pouring. And then he looked at me with this marvelous smile. And he said, you know, when I was being wheeled into the operating room, I realized I've had a really great life. I've loved what I've done, I've loved the people I've been around, just every step of the way. I've had a really great life. And so if this happens to be the end, you know, it's all right. And when I realized that that was really true, I really felt that going into the operating room, I'd kind of won the lottery. So everything from here is kind of a bonus, and I'm gonna put the butter on my waffles. And I, to this day, think that one of the, I mean, when I look at my own you know, list of values, most of which were shaped into me by Bill, one of them is enjoyment. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, if you're not finding it fun, like you need to figure out how to make it fun or you need to stop doing it, I'd still give myself a B or a C on that, right? And um, uh, Joanne and I describe it as we need to put more raisins in the oatmeal. I'm really good at the oatmeal. Like, I got to eat the oatmeal because the oatmeal is good for me, right? Yeah, same. I'm going to beat myself up over the raisins. Great. Well, I've got another question for you, Jim. If success isn't about money, what is it about? Hmm. So, Bill taught me that the real success is in, in how you lead your life. And... I kind of stand back a few, if you really, I think a lot of it, of course, goes back to that idea we talked about earlier about doing meaningful work with people you love doing it with, and maybe you even love the people. I think that's a, a big part of what it's about. But, you know, I, um, do you want me to answer that for myself? Um, I think, I think really um, what you've gleaned from what your leaders would have looked at it, I think is a good, a good way of doing it, uh, you know, as a researcher. Yeah. Um, Again, you go and you, you have to go back to the research and you look at the, we're always looking at the comparative notion of those who really uh, stand out uh, over time in contrast to those that maybe didn't do quite as well. We ask systematically uh, what's, what's different. And uh, in terms of, uh, so let me be very clear that all the folks that we studied that built the great companies, uh, there's no question that they were uh, incredibly driven uh, to make their companies successful. You know, they, never, they never saw it as an or between 
uh, having a very successful and impactful company uh, that could endure uh, or doing you know, really meaningful things, uh, they really embraced the genius of the and. And that's one of the things that stands out about them is they, are, they reject the tyranny of the or and they embrace the genius of the and. Uh, and so what is it uh, about uh, for many of them? I think that over time what I've really come to see is that uh, it is as much about who they are doing things with. I, I really kind of put it in sort of two buckets. One is the communal who aspect and the other is the aspirational what it's all about aspect. You know, so if you, we, we were talking earlier uh, about Ann Baker, for example, and taking over her father's company and building it into a really great company. So you know, what is it about for her? Uh, I never heard her, other than the success of the ESOP being great for her employees, talk about the money. What we found in our research over and over again is that the really great company builders view money cash flow, profits, as like blood, food, oxygen, and water. Uh, they're, they're absolutely essential for life. They're absolutely essential for the success and fueling the flywheel of the company. But they're not the point of life. The point of life is to do something really useful uh, in their eyes and to build something that can do something really useful on a really large and enduring scale and that uh, lives to some larger overall aim. Now we talk all these days today about this thing called corporate purpose as if that's something new. It's nothing new. Uh, we wrote about it decades ago and it had been practiced for centuries before that. And the, the greatest executives always understood there's nothing new about this. It's just been rare, just not new. The greatest executives always understood that we're about doing something much more than making money. And what's powerful about the research that we did is we showed not that that's just like a good idea. It actually correlated with the most enduring, visionary, successful companies in contrast to the comparisons. Like the evidence supports it. So it's not an ideological view. It's actually also empirically validated. Jim, I'm sad to do it, but we will have to ask our final two questions, which are, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? And what is the best piece of advice you could give to our listeners to be great leaders and to last? So, um, well, I, I'll give you a short one and I'll give you a slightly longer one and you can choose which one you want to use or both. The short one is um, John Gardner was down the hall from me at Stanford uh, and he he had a great wise man. John gave me this really powerful challenge. Don't try to be an interesting person. Be interested. And just think if you changed everything, you go to a dinner and you don't try to be an interesting person at the table, just be interested. How does the dinner change? How does everything change if you come at life being interested rather than interesting? The second one was one of the most profound moments in my life from Peter Drucker. And I got to meet Peter when I was 36 and he was 86. And I flew down to meet him at his home in Claremont. And he so warmly and graciously invited me into his home. And we sat there for a day here in his wicker chair and him, I kept wanting to ask him questions and he kept asking me questions and eventually I finally got around to ask him questions and including that one, you know, which, which of his 26 books is he most proud of? And at age 86, he says, the next one, right? And he wrote 10 more. That's what I love about this. He wrote 10 more at the age of 86 uh, to, to the end of his life. And at the end of that day, that was really profound uh, for me, I was, in the process at that moment of taking my big kind of bet leap of leaving Stanford and trying to become a self-employed professor and, and maybe endow my own chair and grant myself tenure if all went well, but I was really scared. I mean, we talked earlier about risk and Joanne and I were taking big bet risk and putting everything we had into, into, into this and maybe it wouldn't work and it was pavement below us that we, we didn't have a safety net. And Peter could tell I was really scared and at the end of that day, he says, uh, we're sitting in this little rental car and he says, Mr. Collins, he had this great Austrian accent. I, I can tell you are worried about if you will survive. I, you will probably survive. 
and you seem to spend a lot of time worrying about if you will be successful. That's the wrong question. And then like a Zen master hitting a student with a bamboo stick, thwack, he says, the question is how to be useful. And then he just got out of the car, closed the door and walked away. Amazing. Almost like a, you know, an animated moment. It was. And, and right, make believe. Exactly. And I think that question is, so I, I would have a hard time picking between those two. Be interested, not interesting. Seek to be useful. Um, what would your, so then what would your own unique advice be? In many ways, the new Drucker to a new generation. What is your u- unique insight to share? If I were to pick, I mean, I, I always, um, I'm a question-driven person. And I would actually channel another great mentor I had, Rochelle Myers, into the question I would give everybody that she gave me. It still would be, I think, the guiding question. If you woke up tomorrow morning and discovered that two things had happened, one, you discovered you only had five years to live, and the second is you have enough resources you don't need to worry about money, what would you stop doing? And I've always loved that frame because you never know when the five years start. Every one of us listening to this or engaged in this conversation, someday that five-year clock will start. Bill thought the clock might run out when he was going in for his bypass surgery, and then in 2004 his clock did run out. But I'm really confident that Bill is here. Whenever, If he would have known when the clock was starting, he wouldn't have changed his life. Even if he knew, ah, I know on you know, December 23rd of 2004, I, my life will be over. The five years before that, he still would have led his life the same way. And I think this notion of when you really think in terms of, what if I only had five years and someday you will, you just don't know when, who would I really spend my time with? And what would I really not let clutter my life? Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Secret Leaders. Before you go, Here's another podcast we think you'll enjoy. It's called The Fault Line, Bush, Blair and Iraq. David Dimbleby tells the story of the 18 months following the terrorist attacks on the 11th of September 2001. 18 months that led to a war in Iraq. He talks to journalists, to spies, to weapons inspectors and to politicians and tries to understand what really happened behind closed doors in Washington and in London. And were the public misled by a prime minister and president determined to go to war at all costs? We think of today as an age of misinformation and lies, but was a seed of distrust sown 17 years ago that has taken its root and spread. The Fault Line is available wherever you get your podcasts. We want to make this podcast as good as it can be, and we need your help to do just that. So, what do you think would make it better? What conversations should we be having that we aren't? What kind of guests would you like to see us interview that we haven't got yet? Tell us on social or email us on hello at secretleaders.com. Thanks. Next week on Secret Leaders. We just had a series of unforced errors in Q1 of 2019 that really set us back at that moment and really was a wake-up call for us to really change the way we build products and run the company. And frankly, that has enabled a great growth spurt for us over the last couple of years. One thing about HubSpot that I think we're good at, we make too many mistakes, but we never make the same mistake twice, I would say that. We learn from our mistakes. That was Brian Halligan, the CEO and founder of one of the world's top SaaS companies, HubSpot. With almost a billion dollars in revenue this year alone, it's fair to say he knows a thing or two about how to design great customer experiences. And he's here to share these insights with you next week. So tune in or you'll miss out. This episode was brought to you by me, Dan Murray-Serta. I encourage you to follow me on social at Dan Murray-Serta for all sorts of stories on mental health and entrepreneurship. But we've also got our social channels at Secret Leaders back up and running now too. So go follow us there, particularly our brand new YouTube channel, where you'll be able to see interviews just like today's on video. If you enjoyed today's episode, screenshot and tag us to share the episode or tweet us. It means a lot. And if you really loved it, why not review us please too? It only takes a second. 
This episode was produced by Rich Martel, with editing done by Harry and Daniel at Lower Street Media, artwork by Christina Naru, and marketing support from Charlotte and Alicia at Mags Creative, and bringing it all together seamlessly, our newest team member, Will Stolliman, as the head of podcast. Thanks for the great teamwork, guys, and see you next week. 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 And see you next week.